Okay, it's 2 p.m. Hello, everybody. Welcome. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. My name is Julia Myers, and I'll be your host for our program today. We are coming to you live from the Brooker Creek Preserve Environmental Education Center. Um, for those of you that don't know, our education center is run by both Pinellas County Government and UF IFAS Extension, uh, which is just an extension of the University of Florida to provide research-based education to the public. Our Environmental Education Center does remain closed currently. However, the preserve is open, so I encourage everyone to give us a visit and enjoy a little bit of wild Florida. Our presentation today on 500 million years of Booker Creek Preserve will be presented by Mr. Brian Magnier. He is an environmental educator, a wildlife photographer. He's also a volunteer here at Booker Creek Preserve. We're very much looking forward to this program. Quickly, I'm just gonna go over a little housekeeping and we will get started right away. Um, you have a Q&A box at the bottom of your screen, so please feel free to utilize that at any point throughout the program. We'll be monitoring that and keeping track of all the questions so we can get them to Brian to answer at the end of our program today. We are also live streaming on Facebook, so to our Facebook viewers, uh, feel free to use the comment section for any questions you have and we'll get those answered as well. I also want to give a big thank you to our friends group, the Friends of Brooker Creek Preserve. They have graciously sponsored our program today. So if you're interested in learning more about the Friends or becoming a member and supporting their efforts, you can visit the Friends of Brooker Creek Preserve.org. And without further ado, we will go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome, Brian, and thank you. Oh, thanks for having me. Um, and thank you, everybody, for being here. Um, as Julia said, my name is Brian Magnier. And I, uh, so I lived in Florida for a few years and volunteered in person at Broker Creek. Uh, but now I currently live in Eastern Oregon. So it's, it's a bit snowy out there here. Um, I majored in ecology and evolutionary biology at Cornell University. Um, and I absolutely love animals and wildlife photography. And except for some of the pictures of fossils and one of the fish, I took all of the pictures that are included in today's presentation. So without further ado, let's get moving. So evolution and fossils, two of my very favorite things to talk about and think about. So much so that I had a copy of this poster here hanging above my bed. Uh, and today we're gonna be embarking on a journey kind of through time and cramming about 500 million years of evolutionary history into less than an hour. So let's get going. So, uh, most of you are probably familiar with Brooker Creek uh, in Central Florida, but since this presentation is online, um, you know, maybe if some of you have not visited the preserve before. Uh, Brooker Creek consists of forested wetlands and pine flatwoods and is home to an incredible variety of plants and animals, from fish and turtles to flowers and bugs. And some of these creatures are relatively new arrivals to Florida, well, while others have seen very little change over many millions of years. So this graphic is a little intimidating, but let's walk through it briefly for now, and then we'll circle back to it at the end, and it should make a little bit more sense by then. So for our purposes, you can ignore that left half of the image. Let's just focus on the right side, on the numbers and the key events. So the oldest events here are at the bottom, with now being at the top. Um, at the bottom, we have the earliest evidence of life from over 3 billion years ago, not long after Earth formed and cooled. But for the first few billion years, life was pretty primitive, slowly evolving, merging into cells and tissues. And then the fun really begins in the last billion years, when everything is diverging and becoming more recognizable to us today. And so this period of time here, around 500 million years ago, is known as the Cambrian explosion. Fossils from this time period show the body plans of sponges and corals and starfish and worms and shells and arthropods, and then just the very beginning um, idea of vertebrates. And so already 500 million years ago, we start getting all these different body plans already on Earth. So this is where we'll begin our journey, uh, because before this, all of the things looked kind of like little blobs and cells, and um, now they're forming into more complex organisms. So 500 million years ago, 
we have the earliest evidence of fish. And at this point, they're still jawless without any specialized fins. They definitely don't look much like the little mosquito fish or the sunfish that you could see in Florida today, but they probably don't look too different from uh, today's hagfish or lampreys, which are still jawless fish. We have very early arthropods. Uh, though they haven't diverged into our different real groups, crustaceans, and insects yet, you can already see that they're segmented and they've got little legs and little antennae in the front here. Kind of like modern shrimp, um, maybe some forms of insects, they look kind of like bristle tails, which you can find under logs. And at this point, pretty much all the life is still confined to the water. 450 million years ago. So the plants are starting to break free of the water. Um, these are liverworts, and liverworts were some of the first land plants on Earth. Um, these guys, they often go unnoticed. They're very small. Um, these little tendrils here are only maybe a couple millimeters across um, and you know a few centimeters long. Uh, but they're actually extremely common at Brooker Creek. If you look closely at some of the tree trunks and the branches, you'll notice these little spidery, um, not really vines, but these little plants definitely are growing on, in there. Also around this time, now that the plants are starting to colonize the land, there's an advantage for the other creatures to follow. Plants provide food and shelter. And so one of the first groups of animals to make it on land are the arthropods. So here's a fossil, 450 million years old, that looks a little bit like an early millipede or centipede. Um, and so these guys were on land 450 million years ago. And then in the water, something that looks very much like a horseshoe, horseshoe crab has already evolved. So these guys have not changed very much in a very long time. Moving forward, Almost 100 million years have passed since the first land, land plants and arthropods. Um, you know, evolution moves very slowly. These are very large timescales. Uh, but now we start, start to see mosses and early amphibians um, starting to break free of the water and emerge on land. The first amphibians were essentially a cross between a lungfish and a salamander. They could breathe air, and they were starting to kind of turn their fins into walking limbs, but they still had to lay their jelly-like eggs in the water, just like frogs and salamanders do today. The big jump to really get away from the water happened with the evolution of hard-shelled eggs. This allowed the vertebrates to break free of the water and really live fully on land um, because these eggs were impermeable to air. They wouldn't dry out. Um, so, and at this, at this point, things like lizards start to emerge. 340 million years, we're still way before the dinosaurs here. 300 million years ago, we get two of the most wide widespread plant groups on earth. We've got ferns and conifers. And in fact, these early forests of trees, once they fossilize and get compressed underground, they turn into coal deposits. So when we dig up and burn coal, we are literally burning the carbon from all of these ancient forests, 300 million years old. What that also means is that one of the best places to find plant fossils are near productive coal mines, like in Pennsylvania. 250 million years ago. Now here, um, we've got the end of the Permian age and this, has, uh, this brings us the greatest mass extinction the planet has ever seen, bigger even than the end of the dinosaurs. At 250 million years ago, 70% of all terrestrial species and 96% of all marine species go extinct. But when some creatures go extinct, that makes room for new ones to evolve and take over. So this point 250 million years ago, is when an offshoot of the reptiles diversified and became the dinosaurs. The age of the dinosaurs lasted almost 200 million years. And during that time, we have a whole bunch of different groups that look very different. We've got little dinosaurs and big dinosaurs, herbivores and carnivores. 
but a lot of them are starting to look more and more like birds. And we'll come back to that a little bit later. Also at the beginning of the age of dinosaurs, we've got the first lichens, which are kind of emerging a symbiosis of plants and fungi. Um, so that's a cool new um, organism on the scene. Okay, the dinosaurs aren't the only things evolving right now. We've got turtles and crocodilians starting to take shape. So these guys have really not changed very much in 200 million years. Halfway through the reign of the dinosaurs, 150 million years ago, and now we see complex the wings still have claws, um, the, the skulls still have a little bit of teeth in them, but these are looking more and more bird-like. Um, this, of course, this is Rix, um, kind of the classic missing link between the dinosaurs and the modern birds. And around this time, we also have many insects emerging and looking remarkably similar to modern species. So things like the dragonfly, we're flying around um, alongside the dinosaurs and look at this fossil, they have not changed in so, so long. They look almost identical to today. Um, and if you walk along the boardwalks, small bridges at Brooker Creek, not only will you see those dragonflies, but you'll see gar swimming down below you. And the next time you see them, stop and think about how little they've changed in 150 million years. Those strong armor-like scales that now protect them against herons and alligators probably first evolved as a defense against dinosaurs. And they still have those hard scales today. Moving ahead, a hundred million years ago, the dinosaurs are still around, but now we get an important uh, like novelty we get flowers and fruits. This is the rise of the angiosperms. With the evolution of these flowering plants, things like butterflies and bees are able to evolve and diversify. Before this time, you know, the, there was no food. There weren't any real niches for the butterflies. Uh, there wouldn't be any real pollen for the bees to take advantage of, um, not from you know, the same multitudes of flowers that would be available. Uh, and this is such a cool picture here. This one, obviously, it's not my picture, this bee in amber, uh, but there's actual evidence of pollen stuck to the bee, when, like preserved in amber. So you can see that they were already important pollinators way back in the day. Nearing the end of the dinosaurs. At this point, the alligators and crocodiles have pretty much perfected their design and they will remain unchanged pretty much since here. Um, but they are an offshoot of reptiles before the dinosaurs emerged. Um, so the alligators are not really the, the living dinosaurs as much as the birds are. A, a pigeon, even a hummingbird, is more related to the dinosaurs than the alligators are, which is really kind of weird to think about. So we've been focusing pretty much on the plants and the animals, we've kind of breezed over the idea that the continents have not always been where they are today. Uh, so this is what the earth looked like about 80 million years ago, thanks to plate tectonics and sea level rise and fall. Um, you can see North America is not attached to South America there. Um, South America and Africa, they're hanging out together. Australia is kind of down here stuck to Antarctica. And if you look very closely, Florida, is underwater. Hawaii has not erupted yet. That's still underwater. Um, Mount Everest is not there yet. Um, so this is before a lot of the modern features of our globe have really emerged. So here's the date we all know, 65 million years ago. Um, we all learned it either in school or maybe while watching Jurassic Park and Jurassic World. <laughs> Uh, 65, 66 million years ago, a large meteor smacks into the Gulf of Mexico, sets off a climate change event that wipes out the large dinosaurs. However, remember that some of those dinosaurs were small and had feathers, kind of like the Archaeopteryx? 
So instead of going completely extinct, some of the dinosaurs were able to actually survive and then evolve into what we now know as the birds. So it's not a stretch or a metaphor to say that birds are dinosaurs. Um, and to borrow from uh, Randall Monroe, one of my favorite uh, comic creators, the creator of uh, XKCD comics, the fastest animal on the planet today is a small predatory dinosaur, falcon. And that's completely true to say in a scientific sense. So once the dinosaurs are gone, there's a lot of new niches available. Uh, we see not only the diversification of the birds, those little dinosaurs that had feathers, but also the mammals and the snakes. And so this is kind of the beginning of the age of mammals. Um, when the dinosaurs were around, there were some small mammals running around, probably similar to the rodents that we have today. Uh, but now that the big predators are gone, those mammals can grow larger and can start changing into all of the range of mammals that we have on Earth. Okay, just a little bit forward, 60 million years ago, uh, the Indian and Eurasian tectonic plates, they finally collide, smushing together and slowly starting to form Mount Everest. So this is when Mount Everest is just starting to rise. Um, also, one thing that's happening in the oceans, one group of terrestrial mammals decides that it wants to go back into the water. And then we see the manatees and the dugongs start to evolve. And this is a full 10 million years before the seals or the whales kind of re-enter the ocean. So uh, just think about that. These Brian, are you still there? Um, kind of near Fort Myers. Oh. Um, some of the fossils, some of the common fossils that you can find down there are from an extinct dugong, similar to our manatee. Um, and these fossils are so common because the creatures have very dense bones to help counteract how buoyant their blubber is. And so those really dense bones are strong and they survive for a long time. And that's why we've got so many of those fossils from these ancient dugongs and manatees still able to be found today. So we had flowers 100 million years ago, but now 50 million years ago, one offshoot of the flowers has evolved into the orchids. And then these go through an amazing adaptive radiation and they spread and become incredible colors and patterns and shapes. Um, and they're one of my favorite things that you can find at Brooker Creek. Uh, these butterfly orchids, you can find them there every summer. Um, and you can think to yourself, wow, these, these flowers have been evolving and changing, but the, the orchids have been around for 50 million years, almost since the time, since the end of the dinosaurs. So look how similar this crayfish is this fossil here is 50 million years old. And then the crayfish that we have today in Florida, they look almost identical. You, you know, it's so amazing that these animals have not changed very much since then. Um, same goes for things like damselflies. Um, by this point, 50 million years ago, pretty much all of the major groups of insects have evolved. So if you were to go back in time and make a bug collection, you'd be able to sort them into most of the major groups of insects that we still have today. Also during this time, about 50 million years ago, now the fish are no longer little blobs. We've got some fish that look a lot like our current fish. This little herring is quite similar to some of the herring that you'd be able to find in any of the ponds around Florida. And that is a 50 million year old fish fossil. That one's from Wyoming. Um, but it's just amazing how little the fish have changed in that amount of time. And now I'm all covered in fossil dust. 
Um, this image here shows the phylogenetic tree of all the bird families of the world. And there's much too much detail here to see anything. So let's just zoom in on one part of the tree. And that's better. Now we can see the years at the top. So on the left, we've got 70 million years ago. Um, basically, we're starting from the end of the dinosaurs. And then we've got present day on the right. And as you can see, about 30 million years ago, so this yellow bar here, by this point, we've got all of these different branches that are already kind of related to current bird families. Uh, so by 30 million years ago, a lot of the, bir uh, the bird families have already evolved. And if you hopped in a time machine and went back 30 million years, you could identify things that look pretty much like herons, owls, and kingfishers. And then if you went a little bit forward to maybe 10 million years ago, you'd be able to recognize pretty much all the birds you saw. Um, there would be woodpeckers and hummingbirds and toucans and ducks all around. Um, and if you recall, 300 million years before this, we had those first hard eggshells. Remember with the slide with the lizard on it? So that's when the hard shelled amniotic eggs evolved 340 million years ago. And now here we've got, you know, just 10, 20, 30 million years ago, all the birds evolving. So the next time some wise guy asks which came first, the chicken or the egg, you can definitely inform him that the egg came way before the chicken. Okay, we're getting closer to present day. We're in the home stretch now. At five million years ago, the sea levels are up a bit and Florida is mostly underwater. So if you go looking for fossils in Florida, um, and a lot of the sediment near the surface in Florida is about this age. And so you can find shark teeth, um, not, near, not near the coast. I mean, you can find them near the coast also, but you don't have to be on the coast. You can find these in streams and rivers in central Florida um, because Florida used to be underwater. And so you can find these marine fossils. Um, it's just like how a lot of the dirt roads in Florida are covered in old shells uh, those are fossil shells from millions of years ago from a time when the sea level was a bit higher. And so all of the, um, most of peninsular Florida was getting coated in fossils from the water, not from on land. So let's creep forward a little bit. Two million years ago. Here, a couple of big things happened about two million years ago. One that's interesting to us is that humans are finally around. Still confined to Eastern Africa, a little bit hairier and shorter than most of us nowadays, but we're getting there. But closer to home, Central America rises up a little bit and the sea level drops a little bit. And now North America and South America are united for the first time in many millions of years. So there have been critters evolving and living in South America that have not been in North America until this point and vice versa. So. Things like porcupines, armadillos, opossums, these guys all evolved in South America and they're finally being able to migrate northward over many, many thousands of years. And from North America, going down through Central America, we get dogs and cats and horses um, and a lot of different animals coming from North America that then evolve or then um, kind of migrate down into South America. So this is called the Great American Interchange. Okay, we're out of the millions and we're into the thousands. So 200,000 years ago, we're in the Pleistocene age. Humans are starting to migrate out of Africa. Um, the sea level has fallen enough that Florida is now twice as big as it is today. Now it's all land. Uh, so from this time period, no more shark teeth fossils. Instead, what we find are the Pleistocene megafauna. So we've got these incredible uh, mammals. We've got mammoths and mastodons, giant ground sloths, like the size of a car, giant armadillos, uh, cave bears, dire wolves, saber-toothed cats. All of these things are roaming 
the forests and plains of North America, including Florida. So you can actually find fossils of these. You can find mammoth teeth and mammoth tusks in Florida nowadays from these ice age animals. So about 20,000 years ago, we still have most of those megafauna, but humans have migrated out of Africa, through Asia, across the Bering Strait, into North America, and they've made it all the way down to Florida. Um, and so here we have these fossils uh, that are, they're still around. We've got ancient horses and we've got uh, mammoth and mastodon teeth uh, pieces. These are fossils that I found in central Florida. Um, they're not too tough to find, they're still around. But these 20,000 years ago, that's kind of the mark where after that, a lot of those Pleistocene megafauna kind of disappear. Um, so humans brought fire, humans brought stone tools. And if you think of a geologic time scale, if you think about thousands of years, millions of years, what humans kind of brought to North America was the immediate ext extinction of all those Pleistocene megafauna. So it's a bit sad to think about the, the herds of mammoths and camels, and ground sloths. They were all directly or indirectly pushed to extinction by people in relatively recent history. Um, so, you know, you think of evolution acting over millions and millions of years, but there are some times uh, where you get those mass extinction events and things can happen really fast. Okay, let's exit the prehistoric times, almost back to modern day. Europeans have crossed the Atlantic. They've moved on into North America. And one man, obsessed with William Shakespeare, decided that America would be a better place if it were home to all the birds mentioned in Shakespeare's plays. Don't ask me why. So this guy played a pivotal role in introducing two of the most invasive and detrimental animals into the United States from Europe. Got the house sparrow and the European starling. He released you know, a few dozen pairs of starlings in Central Park back in the late 1800s. And now they have taken over. And both of these bird species are among the most abundant across the entire continent. All because of Shakespeare and this guy just kind of being homesick for the UK. A few decades later, a traveling circus brought armadillos from Texas into Florida, and then they were either released intentionally or escaped. Uh, but either way, they ended up taking hold here in Florida. So think back to that great American interchange two million years ago. South America, North America meet. Armadillos start moving northward. This type of armadillo was able to get all the way from South America through Central America, through Mexico, through Texas, all the way up to Louisiana. And then it stopped and it stayed west of the Mississippi River for probably about almost 2 million years. And then one person brought this uh, you know, as a circus act, basically, because it looked weird. Um, and all of a sudden, now we have armadillos throughout Florida, all the way up into Georgia. Um, but that's a relatively recent introduction. Um, around the same time, early 1900s, uh, we've got shipping containers moving between Florida and the Caribbean. Uh, a lot more boats going back and forth, a lot of cargo. And two passengers that stowed away are the brown anole and the Cuban tree frog. And these are both now abundant throughout Florida um, and pushing northward. Some of them, the brown anoles especially, you get them, you know, all the way. Basically, their limit is the snow. They don't like the snow. So they'll keep going north through Georgia. So here we are. We're back to today at Brooker Creek and throughout Florida. There are hundreds of species that you can see and enjoy, but they haven't always been there. Um, and it's just, I love thinking about all of this, this history that kind of plays into the interesting biology. So the tree frogs, this top row here, they were all stuck in South America until that great American interchange two, two million years ago. Same goes for the toads and 
the burrowing toad, which is technically a microhylid frog, but they were all stuck in South America until uh, Costa Rica and Panama came up above the waterline. Uh, but the true frogs, the leopard frogs, uh, things like green frog, bullfrog, pig frog, those guys have all been here for many millions of years. And then of course this Cuban tree frog hanging out on the right, he just joined the party in the last century or so. It's a similar story that goes for the butterflies and moths. Uh, most of them, you know, they've been around um, you know, almost 100 million years. That's when they started because they liked the flowers that evolved. Uh, but there are some more recent stories. Uh, the fulvous hair streak. So this little puzzle piece, little jigsaw puzzle piece right here in the middle. Uh, this fulvous hair streak, that one is from the Caribbean. And it didn't actually really live in Florida until humans brought its favorite plant, the invasive Brazilian pepper, in and started planting it in the 1970s. And so even things with wings, even things that can fly over the water, you know, it could make it to Florida from the Caribbean, but it didn't move in because its plant host was not here yet. And so there's all of these interconnected sort of little uh, stories where if you move one plant, if you move one animal, sometimes more will follow and sometimes they will displace other native ones. Uh, so it's very difficult to kind of tweak the environment without having really long lasting rippling effects. And here we are, here's our living dinosaurs, not the alligators. Um, these guys in just the past 50 million years, the birds have evolved um, just beautiful colors and patterns and specialized bills and feet for feeding on pretty much everything from seeds to flowers to fish. Um, and these are all species that you can see um, at Brooker Creek or anywhere around central Florida. Um, these guys are some of my favorites. And the pileated woodpecker, this guy kind of in the center right here, that one is actually pecking at the window of the education center at Brooker Creek. So that one is knocking, it wants to get in. It is also sad that COVID is keeping people out. Um, so that's the, the pileated woodpecker is one of my favorite residents of the woods around Brooker Creek. So let's do a little bit of a recap. So we've covered a lot today. Um, it's definitely been a crash course in this natural history, this evolutionary history. So let's start at the bottom. Life started over 3 billion years ago, eventually getting more and more complex. And then around 500 million years ago, in that Cambrian explosion, we start seeing the beginnings of fish and arthropods. Um, and by 250 million years ago, we're seeing land plants. We've got bugs on land. Um, we've got amphibians and lizards. Um, and then a hundred million years ago, we're already, you know, we're into the age of the dinosaurs. Uh, there were dinosaurs around, the flowering plants are emerging a hundred million years ago. Um, and by a million years ago, pretty much everything would be pretty recognizable to us. You know, if we went back in a time machine to a million years ago, we would be able to look around and I don't think we'd be too surprised at most of the cool, you know, the things we'd see. There would be some, you know, there'd be a lot of mammoths, there'd be a lot of other big animals around, but there wouldn't be any weird body plans or critters or plants that don't have any modern analogs. Unlike when you go back to, let's say, 100 million years ago with the dinosaurs. Um, and then, you know, just fast forward a little bit more into the present, we have our familiar birds, butterflies, our mammals, our fish, flowers, and everything in between but you can trace all of their origins kind of throughout this entire history here. And so with that, um, hopefully we've got some questions out there uh, because I definitely covered a lot of information. Um, hopefully it's, you know, you can absorb some of it. Um, but if not, if you just enjoyed some of the pretty pictures, then that is fine too. Uh, with that, we can definitely take any of the questions that are out there. Thank you, Brian. Oh my goodness, that was fascinating. Wow. <laughs>
Yeah, oh. sorry if I sped through any of it. I can definitely go back to any of the slides if anybody wants a bit more uh, time for any time period. People Thank have you. Period. <laughs> Wonderful. So if you have any questions, please put them in the Q&A and we will ask Brian now. Um, and all of these beautiful pictures on this screen right here are Brian's as well. He's an amazing photographer. Mm -hmm. well, one of our first questions is, as far as um, things being 500, 400, 300 million years ago, how is that determined? Can you talk about that quickly? Yes, Thank definitely. You. So there are a few ways to determine fossil age. Um, there's kind of relative dating, and then there's absolute dating. And so relative dating means um, you can tell something's older than something else because, you know, if you um, if you have a fossil that's in a lower level layer of rock, then it was kind of there before the upper layer of rock. Um, kind of think about it, you know, like let's say you have <laughs> let's say you have your backpack um, in school and it's just crammed with a bunch of stuff. You got papers and books, and it just accumulates throughout the entire semester. When you go through and kind of pull everything out. The papers at the very bottom of the backpack, they're the oldest. So that's relative dating. <laughs> but absolute dating, um, the, the main way is with radiocarbon dating. You can look at the isotopes of carbon um, and different chemical signatures in the rock and in the fossils. And you can actually tell how long ago they died uh, based on these, the ratios of carbon isotopes in the fossils. And that, that gets pretty intense chemically, um, but there, you can do uh, that. That's absolute dating. And you can get, um, you can get a pretty good idea, you know, down to you know, a few million years on either side. Um, and with different chemicals, if you're doing more recent fossils, you can get it down to you know, tens of thousands of years accuracy. Um, but a new one that's kind of fun of how to date things is looking at the genes. You can look at some genetics and you can see how different two creatures are, and you can see basically how long ago those genes must have diverged to create, you know, to make these two different animals. And so that's uh, something that's only been coming around in the last couple decades is using uh, genetic timing of mutations to age some of the um, animals. Thank you. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, our next question is what caused the Permian mass extinction? That one's a little more complicated or a little more mysterious than the, you know, the, the dinosaur, the end of the dinosaurs, we have this giant crater. We've, we know there was this huge meteor strike uh, 66 million years ago. And so that one is more easy to explain. The Permian, it's thought that there was some similar large catastrophe that then triggered some sort of global climate event. Um, it could have been another meteor, though we have not found much direct evidence of that. It could be some sort of giant supervolcano. Imagine if Yellowstone, the supervolcano, went off, you know, as big as possible, and the, you know, the smoke kind of and the ash clouded out the atmosphere globally. All the plants would die. They wouldn't be able to get their sunlight, um, and then that means there wouldn't be enough oxygen. For future generations and over the next hundreds of years, you know, a lot of things would die out. Um, it's actually kind of interesting. I'm wondering, so there were a lot of big forest fires here in the Northwest um, earlier this summer, and I'm kind of wondering if a lot of the plants will be changed or impacted next year, because there were a few weeks where there was basically no sunlight. <laughs> Not real, not real good intense sunlight like the plants were expecting. Um, so yeah, so for the Permian mass extinction, some sort of global climate change event that we don't know the exact cause of as far as I know, um, but it is likely something like a meteor or a volcano. Thank you. And we're getting a lot of questions in. This is great. Good. Um, what is the oldest animal that was on earth? So the oldest animal, it's very difficult, the, the, the definition of an animal, it starts actually getting a little bit fuzzy um, relative to just the oldest life on earth. So, you know, the oldest life on earth was just little molecules starting to kind of merge and act like DNA and start to replicate. And so the first replicators were the first life. 
They weren't even in cells yet for the first probably over a billion years. And the first animal was probably something, you know, if you picture a bacteria or some little protozoan, it was probably something along those lines. Um, it might have been single celled, um, but I don't, I don't know what the first, you know, if there's a definitive first animal. Uh, it's definitely possible if you do some research online, maybe there is one that I'm unaware of. Um, but once you get that old, once you get, you know, a billion, 1.2 billion years in the past, the fossil record is very sparse, you know, less than probably 0.0001% of all the things that existed are things that we know about now. Um, but the first animals that would, that we would recognize as animals would probably be things that look either like sponges or maybe little kind of jellyfish like things that are just kind of blobs of tissue that are kind of vaguely aware of light and gravity, uh, something like that. Definitely in the ocean uh, would be the first animals. <laughs> Thank you. Are there any other prehistoric relatives living in Brooker Creek today other than alligators and birds? Yeah, so, I mean, as we've seen everything, you know, everything has prehistoric relatives. Um, if you wanna think of things that haven't changed much, if that, like, if you're thinking, like a living fossil, things that haven't changed. Um, then, you know, shells, so snails, um, there have been snails around relatively unchanged for over 300 million years. Um, the pine trees, the ferns, those guys have been around 300 million years. Um, the, the gar are definitely uh, one of the ones that haven't changed in a long time. Um, but I mean, yeah, hopefully, you know, one of the takeaways is that everything has origins all together in the past. They're all mixed up back there. So um, you can't say that one thing is more evolved than another. Everything's been evolving in parallel all together for the same amount of time. It's just that the alligators and the gar, they have found body plans that work so well under just enough varying circumstances that they have not had to change. There's been no pressure to change what they look like for a hundred million years. And so that's why they really look like the living fossils. Thank you. And someone asked if you could repeat the part about the meteor wiping out the dinosaurs. Yeah, so here yeah, I don't, we can go back. Um, so what happens is, so the first part, we've got dinosaurs here 250 million years ago, we've got simple feathers, we've got complex feathers, and then we've got all of these different dinosaurs but we've got all, all a bunch of other animals too. We've got birds, we've got crocodiles and turtles. And so what we, what we know about of the meteor extinction is that there was a very large meteor um, that hit in the Gulf of Mexico, kind of near Mexico uh, in the Yucatan Peninsula. Um, and the meteor has some name with X's and T's and it's kind of, it sounds like, you know, Mayan or Aztec, it's very difficult to pronounce. Um, but this meteor hit and what it would do is it almost would behave like a large volcano. It would hit with such force and such, such speed and momentum that it would eject an enormous volume of rock and just gas into the atmosphere. It would, honestly, it would vaporize everything around for hundreds of miles. This thing would behave like, you know, like a thousand nuclear bombs. And this thing would go off and it would just shoot ash and smoke and rock into the atmosphere and the air currents on the globe would bring all of that ash and rock and it would bring it all over the globe. And so the earth would be kind of shadowed in this yellowish smog. Um, and so the initial blast would kill everything nearby. You know, nothing would survive, you know, hundreds of miles around uh, from the actual crater, the impact site. Um, but the real problem long-term is that all of this ash and the chemicals that are like molten hot raining down all over the globe, they would be blocking the sun for years and years. And so when that happens, the plants would die out. And then the smaller animals that don't have any, they don't, you know, they want to eat the plants, they wouldn't be able to survive. And the bigger animals, they really die out a lot. They're actually hit the hardest because they need a lot of little animals to eat. So think of like, you know, a rat 
would still be able to scavenge a little something from what's growing around. Um, but big animals, the dinosaurs, just would not be able to find enough food to survive. And so during these mass extinction events, you really see that no animals on the planet bigger than like, I forget the exact size, but let's say bigger than like a golden retriever, none of the animals larger than that size survive. Everything else is small. And then once the ash clears up and the plants can start regrowing from what's, what's left, then you have all of these extra, this extra space, these extra niches where things can now evolve and take hold. And so once most of the big dinosaurs are all gone, then you get the little mammals and the birds kind of exploding and doing this adaptive radiation around the planet. Thank yeah, you. Hopefully that's the right level of depth. I don't know if it's more <laughs> or less depth than people wanted. <laughs> I think that was wonderful, thank you. Um, and you are talking about the armadillos. Was it the Mississippi River that was limiting their expansion? I'm not sure. It's tough to know exactly what was the limiting factor. Um, I have not, I haven't personally read, you know, all the scientific papers on that. So it's, it's possible that somebody has done that research and has a more definitive answer. Um, it seems like it's kind of a combination of habitat and I would argue that, you know, the Mississippi River is a huge barrier. And if, if it's, uh, if the armadillos only arrived, you know, 2 million years is when the continents connected. So at some point after that, it could, it could be a million years after that, the armadillos finally kind of ranged all the way up into Texas. Um, it's possible that they got all the way to the Mississippi River. And then we're just kind of like, well, I don't know what to do from here. So let's stay on this side of it. Um, but yeah, I, I don't personally know that. Um, yeah, you'd have to do some research or I could do some research and get back to you on that one. Um, but I would, I would bet that it's, it's a good bet that the Mississippi River blocked a number of animals in migrating from one side to the other. Um, and things like that, you know, they definitely happen. If you look at the, um, the Grand Canyon, there's this two species of squirrels that are sister species that were kind of separated by the Grand Canyon forming. And now if you go to the north rim of the Grand Canyon versus the south rim of the Grand Canyon, you've got these two different species of squirrels that look similar, but their populations haven't reconnected for millions of years. Thank you. Um, we did have a question about ducks and geese. Um, they had heard that they're considered the oldest group of birds. Do they go back further than 30 million years? Do you know when they first appeared? So the ducks and geese, they are quite old. Um, let's see this, you know, this is way too zoomed out here. Let's see. So I'm gonna change the, um, the screen sharing that I'm doing for a second and see if we can zoom in on this here and find the ducks and geese here. Let's, let's see if we can find them. We zooming way in here. Okay, so pelicans are down there. Um, and actually one of my friends at Cornell helped work on one of these big giant phylogenetic trees. Wow. So here's the oldest, oldest group of birds because all, all the birds have been evolving the same amount of time. Everything's been evolving the same amount of time. But in terms of things that look uh, probably the most like uh, their ancient ancestors. It seemed, you know, birds probably started out flightless. And so a lot of them were probably more like ostriches, rheas, cassowaries, emus, things like that. Um, but it is true. Look here, we've got the anseriforms, which are the ducks and geese, very, very low on this tree. So they have not changed very much, um, probably in at least 30 million years if not more. Um, and so they are definitely kind of an outgroup to some of the more recent or more, yeah, some of the more recent birds. So there were definitely ducks and geese out there before there were things like songbirds, like uh, hummingbirds or warblers. Um, but yeah, so they are kind of down here with the, um, let's see, we've got pheasants and grouse, things like that, um, chickens. And so they actually have a common ancestor right here about 55 million years ago. So 55 million years ago, 
there weren't ducks and geese and chickens and grouse. There was something that was kind of a relative of all of them. Uh, so they're not as old as um, you know the tinamous and the ostriches and emus and things like that, but they are very, very old. Thank you. Um, and you mentioned that the leopard and the bullfrogs have been here in Florida the longest. Um, do you know since when? Um, I know that the that frogs with their normal hoppy body plan, uh, with their nice long legs or long hind legs, frogs have been around for a, about 150, but maybe 100 million years. Um, those species specifically, it's tough to know you know, when a, one species evolved, but that group, the true, true frogs, as they're called, the ranids, so green frog, bullfrog, leopard frog, those ones, they've definitely been around for millions of years, probably, I would say, in the tens of millions of years, um, but you'd have to find a paper that has a sign, uh, phylogenetic tree that looks like this, you know, this bird one, but for amphibians. Um, but yeah, so back here, where's that? map. Um, so back during Pangaea, you know, even before this map is, uh, we've got all of the continents were kind of smushed together. And at that point, any critters could kind of move freely between all the continents. And so when you have the origins of frogs on all different continents, they're all, you know, they were all together at one point. And then once the continents split apart, that's when they could start independently evolving. Uh, so if North America here, you know, this is 80 million years ago, if North America doesn't come in contact with South America, Africa, or Europe after this, you know, if this is when it splits off, then those true frogs have been isolated for 80 million years from things like tree frogs and toads and things like that. Amazing, thank you. All right, last couple of questions we have here. Um, someone's asking what you would say to someone um, who may think that the latest global warming and sea level rise is just evolution um, and not necessarily human related. So, I mean, I would definitely say, you know, start looking at some of there's a lot of different evidence. You can't just, you know, read a couple of articles or watch a couple of YouTube videos. There's so much evidence. The big one for having it be human related, one is the speed of which it's happening. It's happening in the blink of an eye, geologically. Um, the, the big one is the carbon emissions. If you take ice cores from Antarctica and you can, you can look at the little tiny bubbles in the ice cores and you can see how much carbon there was in the atmosphere for thousands and thousands of years in the past. And those carbon levels have just absolutely skyrocketed since the Industrial Revolution in the late 1800s. And it's, it's pretty unimaginable to think that it's just a coincidence. Um, the other problem is that there are so many extinctions that we can definitively trace to human activity. Things like the, you know, the Pleistocene megafauna, you could say, oh, maybe the climate changed, you know, it was an ice age and then it got warmer. Um, but the fact that so many species went extinct so quickly, um, you, know, all, you know, immediately after humans came on the scene, it's tough to argue that we're not kind of the problem here. Um, and what's really scary is that, you know, I talked about the, the big meteor hitting and making the dinosaurs go extinct. The extinction rate, so the number of species that are out there, another number of animals and plants that are out there that go extinct every year is faster than when the meteor hit during this um, extinction after the dinosaurs. So, you know, if you extrapolate out, maybe it took a million years for all the dinosaurs and all of those things to really go extinct and start settling down. In just the last couple hundred years, couple thousand years, we have already um, just kind of taken out so many species and it's so terrible. Um, so that we are currently living in the fastest mass extinction event that we know of. Thank you. Okay, well, we're on our last question. It's a fun one. It's an opinion question. Um, in your opinion, what is the weirdest animal on earth today? The weirdest. <laughs> oh man. Um, let's see. There's some deep sea stuff that's pretty crazy. I, uh, my, definitely when I think of weird, my mind goes to some deep sea critters. 
um, stuff that glows, all of those. There's one, one of my favorite deep sea critters. It's got to be one of the weirdest, the viper fish. So it's crazy, crazy little, almost eel-like fish, jet black, you know, good camouflage because it's pitch black down there in really deep ocean, giant fangs, you know, for hunting. It has three different types of glowing appendages that have three different uses. So it's got glowing things on its belly that help make it look invisible against the light of the surface. So it kind of makes its belly look kind of eerie blue as if you were down in the deep ocean looking up to the surface. So it actually gets, it has no shadow and no silhouette. So it's got a camouflage lights. It has this weird light on its cheek that it uses as a flashlight that it actually uses to hunt and look for things. And then it's got another weird little light up on its head, kind of like an angler fish that attracts prey. And so it's got three different lights with three different colors and they all do different things. And it's just absurd. And I really want to get into a submersible and see one. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, thank you so much. That was a fascinating and wonderful whirlwind tour of the past 500 million years. Um, <laughs> a couple of people have asked if this is being recorded, and it is. It will be available on our YouTube channel um, within a couple of weeks, and it will also live on our Facebook page under the video section. Uh, so thank you, everyone, for joining us this afternoon. This is our last webinar of the year. So we look forward to seeing you all again in 2021. And thank you so much, Brian. It's always a pleasure to have you. We really appreciate you sharing your knowledge, your expertise, and your time with us. Oh, and <laughs> yeah, and I hope everyone has a great rest of their week and we will we'll see you guys soon. So thank you. <laughs>